Hi class, it's springtime and I hope you're avoiding the most deadly animal out there to all of humans throughout history. Uh, whenever I throw this out to the class and say, what's the most deadly animal out there? You've got uh, all the guesses that go up, you know, everything from uh, sharks to uh, snakes. Turns out that the mosquito is responsible for more human deaths than any other animal, we think. And it looks like in 2017, according to the World Health Organization, it was responsible for about a half a million deaths. Why? Because it carries malaria. It carries actually a um, one-celled organism that causes malaria. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, how it has to do with probability selection and alleles. And if there's a word of the day, although we don't really do a word of the day in here, but if there was, it would be alleles. It's one of our vocabulary terms, one of the things we want to know about going forward in genetics. So let's jump on in. Um, quick recap. You know that different species have different numbers of chromosomes. Humans have uh, 46 total chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. You get uh, 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad. And it's not like straight 23 and 23, they get mixed. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But the way you look is a combination of the genes from your parents, your genes, half from your mother, half from your father. Personally, I think it's amazing the way probability and statistics comes into play constantly in genetics and just across science as a whole. Back when we did a little while ago, for example, radioactive decay, that radioactive decay curve that we saw, it all has to do with the probability of a single atom decaying, and it looks consistent all the time. We're going to talk a little bit about all the places where probability and statistics overlap, where math overlaps with the science, which I love. I always find that uh, that particular part of it really personally amazing and really, really cool to study. So, this part right here, I've got a couple of references over there. I'll mention those at the end. This right here uh, came from a crash course example. They use squirrels. Uh, I'm going to use this made up animal called, called a fuzzy was it? And I made it up. Why? It's easy to draw. You draw a circle or you draw a fuzzy circle. And I would like you to think of this fuzzy was it as any animal. And again, in crash course, which I'll refer to later, they talk about uh, squirrels. Uh, this one, one really easy to draw when you're doing a lecture in front of a classroom, but more importantly, it gets the ideas across. When you're talking about genetics, if you look at something like an animal that has no fuzz versus very fuzzy, fuzzy was it? Um, if you look at these right here, they have somewhere in their chromosomes a gene. Just like, say, a pigeon would have a gene for being white or gray, or a squirrel would have a gene for being uh, black or white or, or brown. This one has our made up animal, just like real animals, have a real gene that determines if it has fuzz, your furry, heavy, heavy coat of fur on it, or if it has no fuzz at all. And when you look at a gene, there's two types there's dominant and there's recessive. And by the names dominant and recessive, I don't want you to think that one is better because it has the word dominant. It simply means, we'll spend a little more time with this, that it shows up. In other words, if you have a dominant gene for a trait, and you know what traits are, things like eye colors, the way you look, the way a, a the physical uh, manifestation of what your genes look like is your trait. However you look is usually determined by two or more genes. Right here we're just doing an example of two. And if you check out a dominant trait, the one that's going to show up, the one that you're going to see if you have it, we always represent that with a capital letter and a recessive trait. One that you could have, but it might not be expressed. You might not see it. That's going to be represented always in biology with a lowercase letter. It's a nice way of keeping track of what genes are going to be expressed in any particular animal. So let's check out this one right here. You've got two fuzzy wasps, and you've got a parent on each side of what this is from the notes, a Punnett square. It's a way, again, of figuring out what will the offspring look like. And if you're looking at this particular parent, this parent has a capital F for being fuzzy and a lowercase f for not being fuzzy. Now, here's the deal. Because there's a capital F, because there's a dominant gene in there, that's going to show up. That's the one you're going to see. That's how it gets its name, the dominant gene. It's got a capital F, meaning that even though there is a gene in this animal's genotype, or excuse me, genome, for, a, uh, for, for not being fuzzy at all, because it has the dominant fuzzy gene, or whatever the characteristic happens to be that you're talking about, that's going to show up. In other words, this parent 
whether it be the mother or the father, is going to be fuzzy. This one, not. Lowercase s, lowercase f, you'll notice that both are recessive. There is no dominant gene in that genotype. There is no do dominant gene in the genome here. So this parent, whether it's the mother or the father, is not going to be fuzzy. So you've got one fuzzy one, one not fuzzy one. On the crash course biology, they use squirrel examples. They use a black squirrel and a white squirrel. And they use it for this really good, good example, which is this. If you have a black squirrel getting together with a white squirrel and they have squirrel babies, it's not like you're going to have a bunch of gray squirrels because they don't mix their colors. It's not like mixing paints in art class. It's a little bit different than that. A gene will either show up or it won't. Mendel used pea plants. We're going to be talking a lot about Mendel and pea plants in about a week. But if you check out this right here, a punnet square, let me grab a pen off the board here, the punnet square shows up like this. These represent four possible offspring, four possible kids from these uh, fuzzy ones that's getting together, almost said squirrels. So you've got capital F, capital F, a little bit like if you ever played Battleship or Bingo, you just kind of go from the top and from the side and see where they meet up in the square. This one right here, small f, small f. This one right here, capital F, small f. And finally over here, small f, small f. In other words, if you had two of these made up creatures getting together, the probability is that their offspring would have uh, two that were fuzzy and two that were. Now here's the deal. Here's the interesting part about it where it comes into probability. Even though that's the probability, and the probability is worked out down here uh, at this note right here, number three, fractions and probability. This is why we've been doing a lot of fractions in math class. You look at two out of four. It's two fourths. We simplify that fraction to one half. If you were to put it in terms of percent, that would be 50% would be fuzzy, of the offspring here of the kid. 50% would be not fuzzy. Um, that's a, a one in two probability. Think about it a little bit like this. Um, I've got my giant hat here, the blue giant hat, which I like. Um, it's a blue giant hat, by the way. That's a, you know, kind of in honor of our awesome principal here at Taylor, Mr. Zader. Um, Taylor, as a community, is really, really, really going to miss Mr. Zader. Uh, he's a Dodger fan. He, he, I, I knew I would never convert him from a, uh, a Dodger fan to a Giants fan. So, in deference to Mr. Zader, I was like, me being a Giants fan, I'm like, okay, I have to get myself a, a Blue Giants hat. And check out the Blue Giants hat. Uh, like we've done in class before with some probability examples, um, I've got these pieces of paper. I've had two that look like this. Uh, small f, small f. They go along with two of the squares here. And you can do this for yourself at home. You can just cut up a piece of the paper. As a matter of fact, there's a home example I'd like you to do with uh, earlobes, with the uh, eye color, things like that. Also cut two that look like this. Uh, large F, small F. All right? In other words, when you're reaching into a hat, we've all done that at one point or another, and pulled out something to do a random uh, sampling, that would be like the kids that you would have from a cross of a fuzzy, fuzzy was it, and a not fuzzy, fuzzy was it. And if you do it, you know, properly, if you mix it all up and you're reaching on here, and I'm not looking right now at the hat, and I pull one out, hey, that's going to be, what is that? It's going to be a small f, small f. Every single time you have two uh, animals getting together and having an offspring, I put that back in the hat. Every single time you've got the same probability. It's a little bit like um, if you know a family that has uh, more, than, more than one child, you can have a run of boys or a run of girls. Uh, my my brother-in-law had three girls in a row, but then I have a friend who had three boys in a row. It's really just every single time you get a 50-50 chance, as they say, a one in two probability, a 50% chance of having one or the other. Same thing here. There is no rule in nature that says that if these fuzzy ones get together and have kids, there's no rule in nature that says if they have 10 kids, that every single one of them won't get genes for being fuzzy. There's also no rule that says that every single one of them won't have genes for being not fuzzy. The point is, every single time that you mix the genes, you're doing a probability. You're reaching into the hat, you're bringing, uh, I pull out another one here. Oh, this one happens to be big F, little f. In other words, that would have nailed the probability here, one of each, right? but not necessarily. It's a coin flip every single time. That's an important concept when you're talking about biology and Punnett squares. 
it's just showing you not necessarily what has to show up, it's giving you a probability of what will show up. If you're checking out, put my hat down here for a sec. If you're checking out this right here, <clears throat> this goes back to yesterday's notes. Humans can have an effect, and nature obviously has an effect on the alleles that get expressed or get, show up in nature. Quick example, I had circles over there yesterday representing uh, bacteria. And we're talking about the overuse of antibiotics and how that can make some bacteria antibiotic resistant. Here, instead of bacteria, I did little circles with um, what are supposed to be um, uh, mosquitoes. Again, quick and easy to draw. But a quick example, a quick example from one of our readings is this. Uh, DDT, if you've got a mosquito that carries the single-celled organism, the protozoan uh, that uh, causes malaria, what happens is it can bite a person, it can then go, the, the single-celled organism goes to the human's liver, kind of gross I know, and it uh, reproduces there. If another mosquito comes along and bites that person, then it can continue the cycle. We'll talk a little bit more about cycles, but you've got the cycle of these mosquitoes biting a person, infecting them, and then infecting somebody else after it's gone through its life cycle in a human liver. DDT is a chemical that kills mosquitoes. You'd think that would be a good thing. But there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, when we talk a little bit about mutations, DDT, it turns out, does kill mosquitoes, but unfortunately, it also happens to be a mutagen. In other words, it can change a person's DNA. In other words, in the case of DDT, it turns out they used to spray it. Uh, there was widespread use of DDT, but it turns out it's carcinogenic. It means it's cancer-causing. It changes a gene. It actually changes a person's DNA where it has the potential to cause cancer, which is uncontrolled cell division. Also, with DDT, it does kill mosquitoes mostly. However, there are some mosquitoes, just by chance. Again, a lot of this is right, it's all random chance in nature. Uh, there is a mosquito that has a gene that protects it, that makes it resist uh, being killed by DDT. If you have a colony, if you have a collection of mosquitoes, and DDT, say, wipes out almost all of them, except for, say, one, that one mosquito, if it survives and if it reproduces, now passes on its gene that makes it resistance to, resistant to DDT. In other words, by selecting, uh, selectively killing the mosquitoes that uh, are vulnerable to DDT, we've selected for the trait, we've selected for the allele that helps mosquitoes survive. In other words, the next time you come along and you spray the chemical that's supposed to kill the mosquitoes, it doesn't work as well. That's one of the things with uh, evolution, natural selection, that we're gonna see is very often we think we're trying to do something like uh, uh, destroy a vector of the disease here, for example. Uh, what we're actually doing over the long haul is making that particular vector, that particular disease vector, stronger. Um, if you check out some of the uh, things I wanted to mention very, very quickly at the very end here today, two references. One is I, I want you to check out if you get a chance. In other words, I'm going to put references down in the uh, description here on the YouTube video. Uh, one is for Crash Course Biology by Hank Green, excellent, excellent source. And again, you don't have to refer to these uh, yourselves, but I just want to start putting in the references, some citations where I get some of the information for today's lecture. The other is an excellent broadcast <clears throat> by Gimlet Media. It's a Science Versus. The host is Wendy Zuckerman. She's a science journalist. In other words, a really, really excellent uh, broadcast. And her today is where we're gonna wrap up the day. Uh, we talked a little bit about bacteria yesterday. We talked a lot about bacteria. Uh, bacteria and archaea bacteria. Uh, recently, there was a drilling project into the ocean floor that went about 300 feet beneath the floor of the ocean, about a, a, a 100 meters down, and they found bacteria living down there, which surprised them. Interestingly enough, the conditions there, they think, are somewhat similar to conditions on Mars. So one of the readings that is going to be posted, I believe, on Friday, talk a little bit about the search for extraterrestrial life, the chemicals that we're looking for, the conditions that we're looking for. It does give us a little hope that, hey, there still might be some life on Mars, because at one time we know 
Marshall's, Marshall's letter. Remember when we had our Martian uh, unit? And in this case, they're looking at potential for finding life, at least bacteria, somewhere on Mars. So, quick recap. We did a little bit with probability, selection, and alleles. The word of the day really is allele. Allele is just a form of a gene. And you can figure out a, a, uh, the genotype. You can figure out the genes a person has based on probability, which is really awesome. Check out the notes on Google Classroom and also on the blog. Talk to you later. Looking forward to seeing you all back in class. Bye-bye.